morning and welcome to Chasing Squirrels. Happy to have you listening once again and thrilled that, uh, you know, you've continued to listen if you happen to be someone that's checked in in the past. So today's today's episode is is kind of going a little bit out to the fringe a bit. A, a good, I guess, mentor and a connection that I have in the Twitter sphere, Jen Apgar, threw down just a provocation saying, you know what, Clough, you should have a conversation with this guy. And I, I love I love this for a ton of different reasons. One, because it's, you know, it's, it is a, a big challenge to sort of find new conversations. I mean, you think about any of those moments where you're just craving to hash out an issue or you wish there was a conversation that would happen more often. You kind of look around the room and you know, it's just you and your voice inside your silo. So I love the fact that Jen has has tipped her hat to this and saying, you know what, you got to talk to this guy. And the second part that makes it interesting is that it has a little bit of a blind date slash play date feel to it. Because in connecting with my guest uh, this morning, I didn't do what I normally do, which is kind of get a little lurky and look at the feeds and look at the conversations and look at the topics and look at all the stuff that that mass of social media postings. I'm just kind of going with the flow. And the third part that makes it the best is that my guest was totally into it. So without uh, any any further uh, positive wash on this, I'd like to, to welcome Chad to the podcast. Welcome, man. Yeah, welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me on, taking the time out of your day to do this. Oh, it's 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 you know what I like I like spending time this way. So th- throw down a little introduction for yourself. Sure. So currently, right now, I'm a vice principal at a K to eight school in Guelph, Ontario, with the uh, Upper Grand District School Board. This is my second year uh, venturing into that space, um, and I love every minute of it. Before that, I was a curriculum leader. Um, within our school board as well. And prior to that, I did a really neat job at the Ministry of Education where I uh, was a student work study teacher uh, doing grassroots research, which was really fun. Um, and then prior to that, kind of in my my other world, alongside of that, I worked uh, in a custody facility as a child and youth worker for about 10 years. Um, and so that's kind of that's kind of me in a nutshell, my my, you know, at a glance background. Dude, that at a glance is gonna take it's gonna take some more get some more glancing. I feel like it's one of those moments where you sort of you walk through a space and something just catches the corner of your eye. And Great. and you know, how many times how many times is that thing that catches the corner of your eye you turn and like, oh, that's just that's my iPhone on the on the table there. Uh, it's kind of rare sometimes where that peripheral um uh, it's almost like um primal noticing. You look over it and you're like that is actually interesting. This is way more interesting than me noticing that my my phone is buzzing. <laughs> Go, even going back to the um, the correctional facility, or sorry, did you say correctional or custodial? Yeah, young young offender facility. So yeah, correction facility. I'm already having the good vibes about this conversation. I think yeah, it's I, neat, I, and I, I really liked uh, I like the blind date uh, concept because it's. I kind of liken it to my everyday at work. I'm walking through the halls or whether it's, you know, my office and people will come and speak to you about what you think it may be. And then in the end, it's completely blindsided, not at all. And um, you're not really sure what you're getting into. So that's why this really appealed to me. Okay. So you're giving me a really cool fork in the road. So you've, I like this, this pivot point of not really sure of what you're getting into. Do you want to shift into uh, an EDU frame or do you want to shift into family frame? Uh, well, let's go family frame about uh, a new family member that I may have. And then we so, can go EDU style. So that's that's the, the thing that totally cued me up when we were talking before we hit the record is the not quite sure of what you've gotten into. And so throw down the, the family member, the new addition to the family. So the new addition is Google Home uh, that we received for Christmas, uh, and it's been fascinating and interesting, uh, and it's also been literally blowing the minds of my two boys who are six and eight years old, because what I've quickly discovered is they they won't know any different than a voice-commanded speaker system that will basically play anything, anywhere, anytime for them, and it's 
it's fascinating to think about that uh, from a obviously from a dad perspective, but then also from you know on the education side of things, and you know out the window with mental math now because Google's pretty good at MathX. So it's it. Uh, I, I, tell me, you've had this conversation with someone, maybe your own children, about the the lineage of of media. So somehow they see uh, a DVD. And maybe that gets you in a conversation talking about CDs. And then maybe you start talking about VHS tapes. And then I don't know how far that sort of spans. Have you had any conversations like that with your children where you're time traveling through media in order to kind of explain your current circumstances? Yeah, absolutely. And really, it's because with with everything just at your fingertips, you literally can you know, ask it to play a song from a specific album and there it is. Um, And if, for instance, like, you know, I was saying just before we hit record that, you know, one of my sons refers to Prince as the Prince. And so Google gets a bit confused and doesn't retrieve a song right away. And he gets frustrated by that. And I'm trying to you know, describe how painful it used to be to find a song on side B of the cassette tape. You know what I mean? It wasn't just as quick as going like, Hey, play this song right now. You know, so we, we do kind of walk in both, both of those, those worlds, you know, we do have a VHS, uh, you know, player at the cottage and in like those things are still, and I keep saying blowing their mind, but it's really hard to, for them to decipher what, you know, basically world to live in when it comes to media, essentially. I'm, I, I, I would, so, you know, we've, we've had the conversations here as well as uh, including something like that in, in, in your space. And it's, I think where we get hung up on is the not, it's, is not so much having something that you can ask a question because even my children now, my children don't often use Siri. Like they don't use necessarily voice commands. They haven't really gotten to that space where they're talking to their technology um, and expecting reciprocity. Like they'll use the iPad and they'll make videos and they love, you know, making the music on it, but there's never the, there's never, there isn't that, uh, geez, it starts to get to like anthropomorphic, right? Like they haven't got to that idea like technology is a living thing. Um, And it's fascinating because they've watched me. There was one time I asked my daughter, I'm like, okay, you need to text mommy because I had forgotten my headset. We were driving somewhere. She's like, I don't know how to do that. I said, okay, just hold down the home button and say um, text Karen. And she did it. And I was able to instruct her on doing something she's sitting in the back seat and afterwards she handed back the phone she's like that was so cool like she had no clue about i don't know it's like befriending technology because that's that's who you talk to you talk to people right so and, there's the and listening she- part sorry i was just going to say it's the listening part i get the talking to but the real tripping point for me becomes the listening part that that if it is actually if you accept it's kind of like part of your family then, you know, like your kids walking in on the conversation between you and your significant and other, Google's kind of doing that now too. Yeah, absolutely. Like last night, um, one of, you know, my boys said goodnight uh, to Google and and she, she replies, which is uh, funny <laughs> and still a bit odd and strange. Because, but wait, um, did, he, did he say goodnight to, to, sorry, he said that directly to the, the, the machine yeah, directly to, to so home. was that before or after bedtime routine like was yeah. that you know no, that did, was after like last ditch resort just basically good night and then the response back was uh so it's not just good night it's something like i hope you have a great night too like it's <laughs> it's quite quite funny um but but it, i agree with the listening piece of it because it's interesting with the voice command system essentially is that um they're they're expecting a response back almost immediately. So if if for instance we just say, "Hey Google," they're expecting a response back. And as I say this, I can see it lighting up. I may have to turn it off. 
Um, but anyways, when you just have the command of, hey, Google, they're expecting her to respond back with like, yes, how are you doing? When in fact, it's not the case, right? It's just a command. And so even the training required to just um, use it effectively is is fascinating in itself. But I also, I guess I, I don't want to shift gears, but almost on the uh, EDU side of things, it's it's also one of those things that's leveled the playing field with, you know, us and our children essentially, because I don't know the capabilities of it yet. And, you know, we've been away, so we're just back. And now we're trying to figure out what are the capabilities of it. And, you know, I, I would say in life, I'm a co-learner and I'm not being corny with that, but I, I do think of myself that way. Um, and this highlights the fact that, you know, they're jumping online to figure out what it can do, how to make it effective, how it will basically better themselves. And I'm doing the same. And it's kind of cool to see, you know, that parallel being drawn because that's really um, just the reality of having, you know, as you put it, a new family member. Is is it, are you in the same room with it right now? Mm-hmm. Oh, I feel even yeah. like, do, 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 do we say hey, it? Google, play Chris a song. Based on the Martha SX Miss Songs playlist. Oh, you're gonna get some Christmas music. Deck the halls with vows of holly. Hey Google, fa, la, 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 la. turn it down. Tis the season to be jolly. Fa la 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 la. Done we now our gay apparel. Fa la 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 la. That is awesome. Hey Google, turn off. That is awesome. Can can I can I can I try something? Yeah. Hey Google, what time is it? Oh, hey, hold on. I have to disconnect my wireless oh, okay. Bluetooth headset. Give me one second. Let's, yeah, let's let's go to the dark side for a second here. Okay, let's do it. Uh, disconnect. Okay, how's that? Can you hear me? I can. Okay, so give it a go. Hey Google, what time is it? It's eleven twenty-five. <laughs> See, I was I was interested because sometimes it won't recognize voices right away, but totally, it, it totally recognized you. Oh, me and Google go way back. Yeah, you yeah. way yeah. back. Wow. See, that just that is just mind blowing. So, um, it was funny when you were saying, "Please turn the music down." I was like, "Yep, just like a petulant teenager." <laughs> what? I can't hear you. I'm playing my Christmas music too loud that you asked me to play. That was so cool. But the interesting thing too is, is that just even with like choice of music and who, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but like if we're having a conversation or have people over and the boys just decide they want to have a little play date with Google and have it playing their thing, you know, you teeter totter between that annoyance versus, Hey, this is kind of just music playing in the background. So you know, we also were also just wrestling with like, you know, who gets to command Google at certain times, you know, of the day of the evening, you know what I mean? And uh, oh yeah, it's interesting. It's fascinating, and it's uh, it's just opened up a whole different little, you know, new new play space. For instance, in the kind of main floor of the house, my spouse talks about how back in the day when in their house. So this is when she was a teenager. So she's got a brother, and. Their, her, I wouldn't say her parents were, or let's say technology early adopters, but you know they 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 had the VCR that could do the time shifting recording, and that was sort of that came up as a second to their first tool for time shifting was basically the family sitting down on Sunday looking at TV Guide and going through it and then deciding when you would be booking your time to sit in front of the TV. So they would negotiate when each of the family members would get to consume their content on the single device that was in the house. So that that schedule would be all highlighted and posted right on the TV, either in post-it notes or, you know, their their local programming. And it's it's fascinating to me. I love the fact I love the I, I just gotta say I love everything about this. I love the dissonance of it because as soon as you know, you have those moments where you, you just get a little growly at your kids and you kind of stop like, oh, 
the windows are open <laughs> and there's people in their backyard next door. They're like, yeah, you sort of almost want to go to the back door and say, I'm not a mean person. I just was a little frustrated. Uh, I'm working on my self-regulation. So you have like the neighbors across, you know, across the way, maybe listening in. Now there's another set of ears in there. Yes. So, so who gets, does, does the, does the, um, I don't want to say it out loud again. Should I, is it okay? Should, if, Cause I don't want to turn it on on you, but, uh, oh, I'm back on headphones again. You know right? what? I'll put you, I'll put you back on headphones here. Okay. And then that way, uh, I don't want to invert inadvertently. Um, I know we'll have some, uh, background music going just, just like that. It is pretty cool. But the, um, so the thing that you made me wonder about is one, is there, is there an alpha? in the Google world. So does it, um, (laughs) does the voice training, does it, does it learn voices? So for instance, if, I mean, you use the music thing, if you walk in and say, Hey, Google, play me some music, it'll know your voice as you and, you know, play whatever music is a part of your favorites. Or if your spouse walks in or if your children walk in, um, does it, does it do that? That's a great question. So that's the uncharted territory that I'm not there yet. And I'm sure if we have like listeners right now, they'll be like shouting at us going, yes, it does. Or no, it doesn't. Cause I, that's the, honestly, that's kind of where we're at. And which also presents a whole different, interesting, uh, you know, bit of scariness. If, you know, if it can start to recognize your, your, you know, your musical patterns, your likes, your, your dislikes. Um, so to answer your question, no, not really, uh, yet it hasn't seemed to be able to do that. However, maybe if I keep asking it to play you music throughout, it'll, I'll start to decide what you kind of like too, uh, which would be kind (laughs) of, kind of cool. Um, but on the voice training, uh, my wife's British with a pretty strong British accent, and it did take a little bit of time to recognize, um, her voice. And then I know, um, she has one at work as well. And I know that once it started to recognize her voice, it, it started to not recognize other people's voices, which was also quite quite funny. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's just kind of still a little bit uncharted, which, uh, which is always kind of fun and neat. Um, you know, and you could draw parallels to education left, right and center on that. Oh, I'm totally, I'm totally going there next on that. Like this is, this is perfect bait. So one of the, in not knowing, and not knowing where we would start. And I love, this is, this is definitely one of the coolest starts I've had for one of the podcasts. Um, here's, here's where my brain goes. Cause what I was going to ask, what I was going to ask you as, as a lead, if we were just kind of, you know, <laughs> parallel playing without any sort of cooperative connection, I was, I was thinking, you know, the podcast sometimes podcasting in general, I find even when I listen to it is that I find myself in conversations that I wish I had had in real life. So in your sort of local professional learning networks, where you're actually across from the table, you got your coffee, you know, they're as maybe random or happenstance as you and I coming together right now, but there's something really cool to, you know, playing off the human in the environment. And I'm not saying that what you and I are right now is not human, but there's also I recognize that I would say 95% of the conversations that I've had in the podcast, I'm still searching for the in real life version of it. Like I want to sit down at a table and kind of do that, you know, that the go deeper with it and, you know, not just do 45 minutes an hour chatting about it and feel like we've kind of, you know, gotten to the end of it. So my lead was going to be, you know, what are, what, what's a conversation that you, you wish you had more often in your EDU life. And I think we've landed on a really interesting space here because devices like mobile phones didn't come into the classroom because teachers thought they were cool. Devices came into the classroom because that was the kid's life outside of school. So now what's mind blowing is you've you've introduced something to your own children you know heaven help the the high school teachers or their teachers eventually when they you know can i bring google home for show and what is it no not show and yeah. tell they call it uh, show and share <laughs> yeah can i, I want to bring google in my friend google so what what impact do you think we're seeing here, like you've introduced, this is a, you can't put this, you know, can't put it back in the box, so to speak. 
Yeah. We're in a really interesting space. Bring this, bring this to your school. So you now get to be the VP having the conversation around smart devices, but not just smart devices that need, um, you don't even need a tactile connection to it anymore. It becomes the smart networked internet of anything, internet of everything device that potentially in order to use properly needs to be listening all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's just like so many ways to go with that, but fascinating in that when, when I purchased it, I, I guess just as any purchase, you, you purchase it and it, it is what it is. Um, and just a full disclosure, I don't work for Google and I'm getting no, uh, I know, I know. <laughs> you know what I mean? I do. No, no, I do the exact but, same thing every once in a while. But <laughs> the interesting thing was, as I was driving the other day, I was thinking, you know, it would be awesome on a, on a realistic note to have one at school, just even in the office to do all of our simple things like playing Oh Canada. You don't have to worry about like our, you know, I'm, I can't believe I'm about to say it, but like our archaic MP3 player that the kids wrestle with. Cause they basically, they run our whole morning routines, which is phenomenal. Um, but they could just start running it through that. And it would be a lot less, hectic it would be easy it would be voice commandable and yes i know with that would become you know the our most amazing students that would probably say the most inappropriate things to google to see what the response would be but it would also be awesome learning experiences for for the kids but also the adults to recognize that this is just the reality of where we're at and it changes inevitable and we, we need to stay on top of our game per se and, you know, not be experts in every single thing because that's not necessary, but recognize that this is where, this is where we're at with society. And, and what does that mean? And just, you know, have conversations at staff meetings and uh, just day to day, you know, fluid conversations about just the reality of that and to poke holes in it. You know, what if, what if, how could we use this proactively? How could we, you know, make this part of learning experiences and not, uh, oh, yet another device, turn it off, put it in your backpack, lock it in your locker because we have no space for those in our schools. Do you know what I mean? And, and that's a constant, uh, I would say, wrestle as as a vice principal, principal, classroom teacher of, you know, where where is the divisive line? I mean, I know school boards that that ban them. I know, you know, France just released that they're basically banning cell phones at school. And, you know, although I get it, uh, I just think that's a sad state of affairs if we have to get to that point where, you know, we're just going to render them obsolete within the confines of 8.30 to 3.30. And the reality is that's just not reality. So, you know, I have thought already thought about, you know, when I go back after the holidays, how do I introduce this as, you know, essentially a provocation like you would in, you know, in a kindergarten classroom or, or, or hopefully and beyond, but, you know, for, and, and get student input too on how they would like to see it. I know, I know there are some teachers that are playing around with it in the, in the French world just to promote, you know, oral fluency with, with French immersion programs. And, at the start, I thought, well, what would be the purpose of that? And then now that the one's here in my home, I think, you know what? It probably has merit or legs somewhere in some capacity if someone was willing to start that conversation. And like I said before, poke holes, try it, make mistakes, um, you know, have it epically fail and then realize, okay, but this really worked well. So let's run with this side of it instead of just, you know, squashing it like we, I don't know, like, it's almost like that's what we tend to default to. So I don't know if I, if I kind of answered your question, I kind of steered here and there with it, but it, it, I think will open up, um, I hope the adult's eyes into, you know, how we can make, uh, you know, not just technology, but new, innovative, you know, ideas come to reality in our classrooms you've you've cracked open i think i mentioned how i have that whole i have the 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 open google doc of questions that um 
I'm still working through to try to figure out not just, you know, a lot of it is my personal inquiry, just figuring out education. Um, sometimes it's the sandbox that I'm just, here's some question lines of inquiry that help with the podcast, but you've just, this conversation has cracked open a brand new area. And I've, I don't know why part of it is it's completely opportunistic. I haven't had anyone that's in this sort of really cool transitional phase, the other part that's kind of mind blowing, maybe that's what it takes to sort of re, you know, to redirect your view in the right way. I use a lot of technology. I've used technology for a lot, a long time. I've been playing with stuff. I was sort of playing with Google Suite when it was um, sort of long before that they opened it up to EDU. So I was using it in my classroom before our school board bought in, and many school boards now have as well. Mm-hmm. And I can remember having the conversation with one of my colleagues because. Around the same time, so it's been about a decade, I think, that Google Apps has been out there. Um, in around the same time, uh, Microsoft was trying to leverage their cloud word. And I forget what it was called at the time, not 360. One of the first iterations was um, was was Word in the cloud. And I can remember talking to him at that time. It must have, they, I'm almost believing that they had it before Google Apps came out. Because I can remember saying to him, you know, I don't know about this, storing my documents in the cloud. And even saying in the cloud, I didn't have a comfort zone with saying the cloud. Like, I don't know if I'm any more comfortable with the cloud now, but for different security reasons. I think at the time, I was like, do I even call it the cloud? Like, what? The, someone called it the cloud. Do we call it the cloud? But I wasn't comfortable with that idea that somehow my documentation, my content wasn't on my computer. So you know, moving into this space now, and, and then there's a whole lot of, as you move into the space, there's there's new fluencies. You have to sort of, you have to expand concepts to include new dissonant ideas. So uh, like I mentioned, the, the idea of an iPhone or a, a personal device, let's say, non-specific, um, yes, I make nothing from Apple either, um, that they were brought into the classroom because the kids were bringing their home life into their school life. And I love the conversations with my colleagues that talk about how do we harmonize the best of both worlds? So I'm excited for you and a little bit freaked out for you because if you really start to dig using, I think I think the, this voice assistant, this home, home assistant at home, there's gonna, I can imagine there's a pretty strong compulsion here to start thinking about, okay, so how do I do a PD session? Um, and do I bring in my Google Home here? Do I bring it it here <laughs> to run yeah. a PD session? Like I'm I'm totally, like I think I'm checking back in with you next Christmas because I want to I wanna find out if this, if this is a thing. Because I feel like this is a, I'm not, I definitely not fear mongering here, but this is a, this is a really, this is a, um, a pivotal moment, I think, in in someone's work life, and I'm because you do have the opportunity to bring something that would be very cool from home to mm-hmm. school. And if yeah. we didn't already have the model of show and share, then I might say, ah, why would you ever want to bring something from home and talk about how cool it is? But I'm kind of feeling that right now. Yeah, and I, I, I hear you, and I think that's some uh, something I wrestle with nonstop in my professional career is how much is too much, where to push when and where to back off when. And and really that, you know, my whole, I guess, philosophy mantra is all around relationships. And so it's, you know, my first year as a VP at a school was difficult to navigate that because I didn't necessarily know everybody extremely well. Um, and I did have the good fortune of being a curriculum leader for four years and traveled to school board. So I knew a lot of the people, but I didn't know them well. So this year has been a little bit easier because I know, I know I have relationships built with people and I kind of know where I can push and what's too much. I also know when I can float an idea out there that the people that know me really well know that that means, oh, probably something's coming down the pipe uh, versus those that are just like, yeah, yeah, whatever, Chad. Um, And I think this kind of is... Yeah, it's been a nice uh, egg to crack open, so to speak, in terms of, yeah, when and how do I introduce it? Um, Because I probably will, because I just like to, you know, I like to push people's thinking in a positive direction as to kind of what if, you know, what if we could 
make this happen? Or what if, you know, with the, you know, let's say it's a new math initiative. What if, what if we tried this and what if we started to figure out what's going to work and what doesn't work? Um, because I feel like if we spend too much time living in the philosophical world, we don't actually end up giving it a go, rolling up our sleeves, trying to make it work. And so, you know, if nothing else, I hope today, you know, even, I mean, I'm going to wrestle with all, all of this uh, naturally as I do every day. Anyhow, you know, I kind of hope it would be neat for you to to think about too, you know, is there a possibility or a way that you too could introduce this in your classroom, right? In a, in a meaningful way that augments your curriculum as opposed to it's just kind of fun and cool and flashy, just like, you know, the first generation iPad when it hit the schools. It was kind of like, this is awesome, but no one really knew how to leverage, you know, and make the curriculum alive, so to speak. So, you know, it's kind of still one of those in its infancy, but, you know, I think it's important to to push the envelope um, so that people have time to wrestle with it. Um you know, and I keep coming back to making mistakes because I believe we learn through through making mistakes and um, and failing essentially, uh, so that we can problem solve. Um, and I was going to come back to one of your other points when you were talking about using a lot of technology in your building. Um, and did do you become the go to person for troubleshooting and problem solving essentially? Because I just found. Before the break, uh, I'm also uh, a point of a resource teacher as well. And part of my responsibilities is to look after the SEA equipment for students who, um, that have identifications. And I found myself just being the go-to like tech problem solver, so to speak. Um, and if you really knew me deep down, that's really not my thing. But, you know, uh, I do it. And so then I started thinking, well, I have basically created a crutch right now for people and it's driving me bananas because I want people to be able to students and teachers to be able to problem solve and troubleshoot rather than default of emailing me or walking down the hall to say, Hey, you know, Mr. Ray, this thing's not working. Uh, and so I've been wrestling with that right now about when I go back, you know, how I introduce that concept. Cause I can't just start pushing people away because that won't be well received. Um, but it's just interesting. Those are the, you know, the worlds that I kind of live in with looking at the systems and the structures that I, that I've put in place that, you know, are almost failing me per se in that, you know, I'm just becoming the, the problem solver instead of having people critically think themselves. So um, that's, you know, something that to just resonated with me when you were speaking before um, about the influence of technology in buildings and it's ever increasing. Yeah. It's um for me, what you, what you, what you touched on is that um, I'm, I'm entirely comfortable being that, that go-to person. I'm, I'm comfortable. Ask me questions. The, you know, pursue me, Stop me as I'm sort of getting into my car. If you happen to know, <laughs> happen to know somehow that I love going to a certain coffee shop, and if you were to walk by, I would never, I, I would never sort of, I would never not provide support or whatever resources that I happen to have with me. It, it you make me think though about the um, there was a role that I had when I was in. So I teach in high school. Uh, I right now my portfolio is I'm working with students that have been suspended or expelled from regular programming. So this is at a high school level. Um, prior to that, I was an alternative education uh, department head, and then prior to that, special education, and then guidance before that. And then when I first came into hospit, uh, sorry, first came into education, I was teaching hospitality. So I was a tech teacher when I first came in. So along the way, I kind of got used to. Um, the hospitality, because I was sort of like the only chef, there was lots of questions, people ordering food. Like there was a lot of requests that felt a lot more like I was still running a business than teaching high school students. Cause there was some, there was a nuance to what I was doing. It seemed like I was the only one that could answer those questions. And then when you go into guidance and spec, spec ed, then you very much are centered in that space of there's a whole lot of decoding that needs to be done for colleagues and the students and the communities and system. Like you're just constantly 
um, disaggregating or pulling apart the big term. Like even the fact that you would say without pause, the SEA equipment means it's sort of a measure of not only the complexity of the language that we use, but I'll tell you, there's someone listening to the podcast right now that has got no clue what that, what that, you know, that sort of acronym, we get very comfortable right. with that jargon. So the SEA is, do, do you want to throw down just what that, that, that acronym is? Sure. So it's basically for students who have been identified with uh, learning difficulties and basically through that, lots of times it's through, you know, I mean, there's a whole a whole range, but through uh, written output, uh, they are given a device. Uh, typically, it's a Chromebook to use. Um, and for us, we're using Google Read and Write, essentially. Um, and it, it allows students to be able to um, become more uh, assertive and expressive on how they can complete their assignments and get their work done to the best of their ability using assistive technology. And so it's been a game changer. It's been an absolute game changer for, I would say, all students, not just students with identifications. Um, I mean, personally, I guess I'll go there. I, I just finished writing a book about uh, the importance of failure is, as a learning process and, and not a final state of being. And for the majority of, of the book that I wrote, I used voice-to-text technology uh, to get my thoughts down. Uh, and it was just an easy way for me to, much like right now, feel comfortable in a conversation, get my ideas down, have that software read it back to me so that I could see if it made sense, um, you know, alter, change, uh, all of that output so simply. Um, and so for students that have, you know, let's just go with written output issues, that C equipment has been an absolute game changer. Um, and on the notion of, you know, failure and resiliency and making mistakes, that profile of learner, that's the world they live in every single day. And so sometimes for me, it becomes frustrating when, you know, we have adults, teachers, students who are resistance are resistant, I guess, to change and not willing to give something a go when there are other profile of students, you know, in every single building in every walk of life that, you know, that's their, that's their everyday world of, of troubleshooting, making mistakes, learning from those uh, to, to, you know, basically add to their schema, essentially to make them a better person, you know, and that, that branches out into ESL, FSL. I mean, and again, English as a second language, French as a second language. Um, again, those students, that's the world they live in, right? It, of not understanding a uh, full language we speak, let alone, you know, the specific math content that we need kids to understand so that we can improve our, our test scores, so to speak. Um, so I know I'm kind of all over with, with that, but I just think it's really important to recognize all, all of – all the profile of learners in the relationships in a classroom to maximize everybody's output and to not minimize it as, oh, they need assistive technology and therefore we've categorized students. And, and I just think that we run the risk of, um, you know, not doing every student justice if we if we kind of fall into that those categories. I, I get a ton out of your answer. And this is what I love is that the the seed point to this was just unwinding the CEA kind of yeah. acronym, like what's going on there. And this is exactly the backstory. So your response to this is completely on point because that is if someone pins you as the key resource to be able to not only expand the definition, but also to expand the concept and the philosophy behind it, that's when you become valuable to people. Right. And then you're able to sort of relate it in a way that an individual can either take the quick Coles notes version of it, or they really need convincing. They need something at the deep. They need to see the heart of the matter. So I think that's why I was just, I was poking at the CA because it is one of those acronyms that gets, it gets passed through conversations. Like everyone's in the common tongue and someone in the group is like, okay, what is that again? And then they wait around and they're like, oh, okay, that's the sort of part of the funding that sort of gets a kid some sort of technology. And, and when that happens, whether you're the technology person or me, I was the chef, everyone wanted to talk about cooking. 
or if you're the guidance counselor because you somehow have the market cornered on how to get into post-secondary destinations. Um, I always found myself really comfortable with being there. Yes, fatiguing, absolutely fatiguing. So then it, where I kind of shifted to was, how do I share if it's not me sharing? So I think that's where I started to find technology as the person, <laughs> sorry, as the place <laughs> to the place to, to sort of warehouse some of that stuff. And then how do you, how do you develop the fluency tools to exist in a digital space that felt similar in some ways to someone asking you a question directly, which is, you know, when I talk about those conversations that you have across the table, those, those social negotiations of getting your point across and embracing somebody else's point, it's totally different then like if you and I had somehow gone off the rails and not connected on the front end, this podcast would read. Someone's going to hear this on the end and like, those two are just not connecting at all. If you can do that in real life, then, you know, I do believe that you can use those tools to do it digitally. So I don't think there's a mystery why you and I are able to connect in a space like this because I get the feeling you understand relationships. I, I firmly believe that without them, there there isn't much there. It doesn't really matter how much you know or how much content you you store inside your head. If 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 relationships aren't there, aren't fostered, aren't worked at, because they're a ton of work, um, you lose the that ability to share that to to spread it and to make it that much more powerful and. You know, that's something that I'm constantly uh, working at and reflecting on is the relationship building with, you know, essentially everybody. I mean, I know it can't be everybody, but, you know, right away I just went to teachers in my building, but staff, like students, caretakers, office coordinators, and my message always is, and, you know, my principal Steve would echo this if, if he was in this conversation right now is is challenging everyone to take a risk and be the best that they can be. So not comparative. It doesn't have to be the best compared to someone else. Just what's the best that you can be and what tools do you need to do that? And what, how can I help that essentially? Uh, And all that has to happen through relationship building, through conversations, through, through sharing information, you know, in passing, you know, I had a teacher that kind of, caught wind about the material that I was writing. And, you know, he started asking a lot of questions that I kind of knew he was interested in. So through that, I just started sending him some stuff, you know, online, just little nuggets of information, if you will. And suddenly that had flourished our conversation into way more richer, meaningful conversations about taking risks and uh, wanting to try something new and, and then having the permission to do it. Right. And so, by I hope by me modeling to staff, to students, to colleagues that we're going to try something and it's okay if it doesn't go well. It like absolutely is okay. Now, if it doesn't go well 15 times in a row, then we have an issue because we're not learning from what didn't go well. Um, but just that permission to take a risk and give it a go and then support where needed, I think that all has to happen through relationship buildings and it even got to the point where you know this particular teacher had a performance appraisal this year that you know he's a 25 26 year veteran uh, teaching a lot longer than I have been and so our conversation came with me saying you know this is a risk that I'm taking as as a vice principal to ask you to try something new during your performance appraisal and we'll give feedback according to that. And in return, I would like feedback on why I chose to do that and the process that we embarked upon. And so it was really neat to to see, well, it was interesting because it was two teachers, a resource teacher as well, that did the performance appraisal together, uh, which, you know, he later had said, well, obviously he had never done something like that before, but was comfortable taking the risk because you know, I honestly have to chalk it up to to that, just that, the relationship piece of, of you know, fostering, you know, to get the best out of each individual. So, yeah, they're, they're critical to me. And um, I think the people that know me well, and again, I would love to, 
you know, sit in the same room and have a conversation with you about a whole bunch of things in person, because I feel like there's, there's just that much more to know about someone, their body language, their facial expressions, you know, whether or not they're agreeing, you know, on the surface with a head nod, but yet deep down, you can tell, uh, there's no way I'm taking this on board, mate. So, um, yeah, relationships, if I just to sum it up, are critical to me, they're key. And I, I firmly believe in them. The, um, so a little bit of your your backstory, because mm. that becomes one of the one of the places that um, I've had. Well, I had I not pushback, but I guess some of the the commentary back about the podcast and conversations that I've had is that what's what's been fascinating is is the how. Um, sometimes the why can be good too, but the how is in you know how were how have you become the individual that's that's right now how did you make that process work how did you um work through the challenges of a certain um thought experiment so how what's the how for where for who you are right now as as a vice principal and you can come at it sort of like experiences or you, you know touch points in your career so far because i think there there could be someone listening saying well, I know there's probably someone listening saying, I, I get it. I get that I need I need to sort of take some risk. I need to um, sort of try a new thing. I need to sort of look at technology in a more partner fashion as opposed to, you know, sort of cold, like just an extra thing to do. Um, what what have been some of your some of your experiences that you feel are, are kind of formative to who you are as a vice principal right now in front of your staff, you know, in front of other learners? Yeah, that's uh that there's a lot there. I think um, I'm going to go right, I guess, right back and I'll try to be succinct, but I grew up on a farm uh, and I was obviously through growing up on a farm. There's a ton of problem solving and troubleshooting and just day to day operations, whether it's, um, you know, simple thing that I'm not going to get into all crazy farming talk, but you know, there's curveballs that are thrown at you every single day. Like you go out and all the water lines are frozen everywhere. And that was not what you were expecting that day to get done, but that now becomes priority. So that piece of it helped me with prioritization uh, and just problem solving, troubleshooting on the fly. My dad, uh, both my, my parents uh, put me in situations, I would say, where I I had to problem solve and troubleshoot. And that those experiences helped uh, drastically. I would say another big piece of that is is the concept of team and team sports. I played a ton of sports and, you know, most of the time became assistants or captains of, of our team. And therefore that leadership, those leadership opportunities um, were, you know, life-changing in terms of having someone look up to you, having decisions being needing to be made that, kind of all eyes suddenly kind of turn to you and you think, okay, well, you know, I, I'm going to make a decision and it, it may epically fail and go wrong, but that's okay. I'll learn something from it. Uh, so those experiences were really helpful uh, in terms of education, working in the custody facility were instrumental just because it was so different than your mainstream education system as we see it today. And I think that's allowed me to respect each learner for who they are and the path that they chose to get wherever they are, whether it's in custody or, you know, your kind of A plus role model, uh, honor roll student. And those pieces where, you know, everything's unorthodox when you're in a classroom in in custody. I mean, you literally see everything uh, and get called everything. And, And how you respond to that, I think, dictates who you are. You know, things are going to happen. Failure is inevitable. It's, it's how you respond to that. And I think for the, if there's people listening right now that say, yeah, well, I, I'm not sporty. I don't play on a team. I didn't grow up on a farm. You know, uh, I didn't work in custody because why would you? Um, I think for those listeners, I would say I've also had some amazing mentors along the way that, I could ask questions and reflect upon to say, Hey, I'm going to try this. And, you know, obviously I would love some feedback on it, some input, some, what do you think? And have that dialogue almost like we're having right now. 
and and then go give it a go and then reflect upon it. So document, you know, when at our school we've done we've taken on some really neat projects where teachers have collaborated to build, you know, solar power barbecues, for instance, in grade seven and eight. And one of the coolest learning from that was the teacher mentorship relationships that started to happen in conversations about how much it seemed like it was a big risk to take. But then when you had someone to dialogue and say, okay, this worked really well, that didn't, why didn't it? Let's try this differently next time. Those conversations and networking relationships were critical to then say, okay, now we can go forward with being comfortable trying something new. And so I think there was a lot of pieces there to my response, but I truly believe each one of those pieces or experiences, you know, helped me get where I am today. And there's, I obviously still have a ton of growth that, you know, through my relationship with my principal and my, my mentors, formal or informal, um, you know, I'm still there, you know, I think probably for you today was taking a risk. Uh, and for me today was taking a risk. And at the end of the day, I hope no one got harmed in the process. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I feel, um, I feel unscathed. I, yeah. I'm thoughtful. You've, you've pushed my thinking in a lot of different directions, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm all good, man. I'm all good. Um, I mentioned that whole, you know, noticing things on the peripheral and sort of just from the corner of your eye, sort of something that catches your attention. The, um, the individual, the individual that worked in the um, custodial setting, you know, kind of looking back on your, on your career, one of the jobs in your career, um, what might be surprising to that individual as to where you are and what you're doing in education right now? Is there anything in particular that just, you know, would be noticed that that older version of you? Mm, yeah. Oh, that's a good, good question. Uh, yeah. I would say one of the things that it's, that it taught me and that I, I truly do reflect on now being a little bit older than my days working there is the just, the understanding and the patience piece in that not everything's just going to work perfectly like you drew it up. And even though you have a perfect game plan uh, and you think the rollout and you've, you've poked holes and you, you know, you've looked at it from every angle, it just may not go that way. And if so, the flexibility to adapt and the patience required to work with children is, is really important to, to think, think about and stick with it and be resilient towards achieving whatever it is that you set out to achieve. I think it's easy when you're, you know, at the time I, when I started, I was 18 years old working in a custody facility with, uh, you know, kids that were as big as me probably looked as old as me. And there was an intimidation factor, absolutely of working in that facility, but, you know, back to relationship building, understanding kids for who they are and then being patient with them and not judging are, are were critical pieces that I think still now I still have to remove myself and kind of zoom out bird's eye view and say, okay, you know, by making this decision, did I just, you know, incidentally categorize or marginalize this particular group? And so those pieces I'm still, you know, constantly – reflecting on and try to ask those questions out loud one of the things that you've really you know pushed my thinking as as we're doing a lot of talking is is how can I be more transparent about uh that vulnerability and decision making that that I make uh with you know both staff and students uh so that they they get a better grip of the why and obviously the how but the why behind uh, the decisions that get made almost on a day-to-day flow. So that's something I'll leave this conversation with for sure to just uh, push and think harder about what, you know, how I can be a bit more transparent. That's cool, man. That's cool. Mm-hmm. So we're, dude, we're like at f- just under 55 minutes. It's crazy. Like we've, we've time traveled. It, it feels yeah. instantaneous. Um, so Moving, looking forward just a little bit. And that's that's a little bit of the, that's, I guess, still a thing that's a part 
of the heart of you know this podcast and this sort of really wide wide reflective practice that i'm i'm just thrilled that you kind of jumped into my stream of thought. And like I said, no harm done. I'm all good. Lots of lots of new sort of venues for the ideas that are spilling over the edges. Moving moving forward and looking forward. What you got coming down the pipe? What's what's a thing that you're you're jazzed about working on? Um, little bit. I said to a, a colleague who's going through the process right now to become an administrator, and they said that they were becoming becoming fearful because it was becoming so real. Mm-hmm. And I just sort of just really quick, quick answer. I said, it's remarkable sometimes how similar fear and excitement can feel. And I think you can kind of choose to exist on one side or the other sometimes without even, or you, we do choose. Um, they were not all that happy with that response because they were fearful. <laughs> well, I was trying to give it a little, trying to give it a little bit of a spin to sort of make it more, um, I don't know, a little bit more agency in there. So I'll put it to you. Fear, Fear or excitement? What's coming down the pipe that uh, kind of has you just a little bit on that energetic edge? Well, I, the fear, I think the fear also just lets you know you're alive too. I, I try to remind people of that and myself at times when I think, holy man, I'm about to step out of the box so far here. Um, it, it does remind you you're alive. So I would say fear being that at some point, I would hope that I'll be a principal and run a school on my own. And that's uh, scary. That's a scary thought in that I have a lot of really good friends that have just kind of taken that leap in the last year or so, uh, which make it really real because our conversations are real about that. So that's scary to think about that. Um, excited slash scary also is, you know, hopefully, um, the book that I've just finished writing will be published. I, I hope it's with a publisher right now. Uh, so that's just plug, plug away, dude. If you want to, if you want to drop it, you can drop it. That's okay. Uh, At this point right now, you submit a a variety of working titles. So uh, I'm not fixed hardcore on a a title per se. Uh, It's nine chapters, lots of concepts that we've touched upon today. Um, So that's exciting and scary at the same time because I feel like you're kind of putting your neck out on the line and and kind of carving a, a line in the sand. So that would be awesome if it got published. That's not the reason that I wrote it. It was pure to, of passion and, um, yeah, honestly, passion and experiences traveling around the province and the school wards, working with different people. Uh, so that's obviously scary and exciting. And then just nothing major in terms of uh, presenting at, um, you know, conferences and stuff like that. I've done that a lot in the past right now. You kind of get hunkered down at a school and kind of focus in there. So, you know, at our at our principal retreat coming up in April, I, uh, my principal Steve and I are presenting on some concepts about uh, some systems and structures that we have in place at our school that superintendents would like us to share around how we're uh, our support staff, so our, our CYC, Child and Youth Worker, um, and our EAs are supporting children uh, with some intensive support with specific intentions. And so that's exciting for me because I truly believe we're making an impact with our, some of our most at, at risk youth and that being with my background and obviously with, with yours is a, is a true passion of mine. So yeah, those are some upcoming things that I'm excited about that kind of keep me alive, keep me in the moment and uh, kind of steering the ship in the right direction. Cool stuff, man. Where would um, someone want to reach out, have a combo? pick your brain a little bit who uh, who how how would you like to be found uh it's probably easiest just to find me on twitter at chad ray c-h-a-d-r-e-a-y uh it's probably the best fastest uh, smoothest avenue of communication if people want to reach out uh and much like you i'd love to chat kind of just expand that network is always um it's fun it's exciting it's cool and I, i'm gonna i'm gonna just i'm gonna go back to the beginning a little bit because we we've we've entirely looped away from uh from jen but i'm gonna take i'm gonna i'm gonna take her her thing a little bit you know introducing me to you or connecting me to you and uh when we get off air i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you uh, the question who should i talk to next and i'll i'll add that a little bit to my list because i think there's there's a really cool thing here. Well, here's the one thing I recognize. Not everyone that I would really love to talk with is represented 
in spaces that are easy to access. I'm learning that very quickly, that just because Twitter is a great place for you and I to land and, you know, people might have professional blogs there. I've learned that there's individuals that don't use a lot of those platforms, but still would love to share their experiences. So I'll ask you that off air, just so we don't put anyone on blast. Amazing. And, uh, and dude, we're at the end. This was awesome. I'm my, I, I have a bunch of little scribbles here that I'll share back with you just to encapsulate, encapsulate the, the convo. But I really appreciate you taking your your Saturday time to to chill with me. Yeah, likewise, Chris. It's been uh, it's been great. I love to, uh, like I said, love to connect, um, and I, I respect what what you're doing with the podcast. And uh, you know, now that I'm more in tune, I would love to share it out and have more people um, listening in. Just uh, because what you're doing is is great for education uh, and beyond. Cool, man. I appreciate that. Well, take care of you and yours. Enjoy your your new family edition. And I look forward to however you and I connect again. Uh, there's still stuff. There's still stuff I want to ask you. So who knows? We might make it to a uh, a version 2.0 or heck, maybe I'll, I get to be a guest on your podcast one day. <laughs> Sounds good. Happy New Year. Yeah, you too. Take care. Thank you for listening to Chasing Squirrels Podcast. This podcast can be found on iTunes and you can find it on Podbean. If you are interested in having a conversation on the podcast, please, 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 please reach out. You can connect with me on Twitter at Chris J. Clough. You can also connect with me on Gmail at the exact same handle, Chris J. Clough at gmail.com. Every once in a while, I drop a blog post on WordPress and I'm sure you could throw something in the comments there. I really, really appreciate the time that you've spent with me this evening, and I look forward to dropping another podcast conversation very soon.